Welcome to Watch Symposium. I'm Austin. Part two, talking about the Tudor Iconaut. Now, in part one, we talked about the Iconaut in terms of the five-factor model of watch assessment. If you don't know what that is, link in the description. And I'll also put a link in the description to that first video when we talk about the first two factors in terms of this watch, form and function. In this video, we're going to look at the third factor, value and value retention. Now, on average, this is a $3,000 watch as of 2020, 2021. You can get it a little bit less without box and papers, a little bit more with box and papers. I paid just about three grand for the watch. Now, apparently you could get it back in the day for 2000 USD. That makes total sense because 2013, 2014, you could get a no date sub for a little bit over 4,000 USD. You could get an Explore 2 for a little bit over 4,000 USD. A pre ceramic GMT Master 2 for 6 to 7,000 USD. So the idea that this was going for, you know, a couple thousand less than those watches back then is insane. My guess is you could probably get this watch back then for a thousand USD. And so if you bought then, then you got a lot of value retention, all right? Before we talk about value retention though, let me just talk about is it a lot of bang for buck? And I think it's pretty clear it is. Everybody has their idea of what a good mechanical watch should cost. For me, it used to be about 5,000 USD. That was like the base price, but Rolex prices have changed. They've gone up. And, you know, if Rolex is your benchmark and it is mine, then that's probably changed. And so for me, it's about 10,000 USD for a good quality mechanical watch, i.e. a Rolex. And so by that measure, this at 3000 offers a lot of bang per buck. Now, keep in mind, it's a Tudor and there's that Rolex connection with Tudor, the Rolex quality, and you've got the Rolex servicing behind it when you need it. It's not 100% Rolex. The movement is a Valju 7752 movement. Now, if Rolex did what they do to their uh, ETA movements, in their older tutors, then that means they've tweaked it, decorated it, and made it better, made it just about as good as a value movement could be. And this watch runs at a little bit better, a little bit more accurate than less than one second a day. So it's a very accurate quality, highly functional watch for 3000 USD. And I don't know if there's another watch out there that, that offers that many functions and that kind of quality and you know it's it's not rolex name recognition but it's tutor it's kind of rolex in disguise if you will at this kind of price i don't know if there are other watches that can really compete with it but um yeah it's it's a lot of bang for buck and i think it offers a lot of value and i feel that way about the iconaut and the hydronaut all right both and i don't ever recommend those watches but personally speaking, I think they are incredible value. Now, of course, touching on aesthetics, I think the Hydronaut is an objectively better looking watch than this, all right? Can we talk about objectivity in, in terms of, you know, good looking and, and bad looking? I don't know, but uh, I, think, I think that's an attractive watch. The Hydronaut 2, not so much. The Hydronaut 2 and this watch actually resemble each other, so, if you like the quite hideous Hydronaut 2, then this might be the watch for you. But my whole point is that these knots, the Hydronaut, Aeronaut, Iconaut, from this kind of weird period in Tudor's past offer a lot of value. And it might mean coming to grips with an aesthetic that is perhaps an acquired taste. Again, I don't think so, so much with the Hydronaut because I think that is a beautiful watch. and. Is very interesting because it's a, it's a great transition from the older subs to, I guess the the weirdness of the Hydronaut two and Iconaut and I think the Hydronaut one is a is a, a beautiful transitional Tudor. I would feel a little bit more comfortable recommending that than this because again uh, the aesthetics I, I think are uh, better on the Hydronaut. So anyway, value. Wise, I think this offers a lot for obvious reasons. Value retention, I'm not really sure. If you bought earlier, absolutely. I'm not sure what prices are going to do. I don't think they're going to go down 
because, again, this is a, an interesting blip in Tudor history, in Rolex history, in the sense that they've never made a Swiss army knife watch that did it all. I mean, that goes squarely against the ethos of, of Rolex and, and their sort of one function, one persona, one identity per watch model. And so if people come to appreciate that and value that, I think there'll always be a niche market for this watch. Now, do I think it's going to shoot up in the future? And, you know, I can only speculate, we can only speculate, feel free to speculate in the comments section, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, but it's always the ugly ducklings, it seems. It's always the, the ones that people say, nah, it's not gonna be that. Nobody's gonna want that watch. Now, is that watch this watch? I'm not sure. Is that why I bought the watch? No. And how would I feel if I woke up tomorrow and it was going for 10,000 USD? Would I be happy? Yeah, partly happy, but it would change my relationship with the watch and I wouldn't be able to casually wear it and it would infringe on the usability of the watch. That's another factor we're going to talk about. But this offers a good balance of value in the sense that it's not a cheap watch. I mean, if you're not a watch person, a $3,000 watch is insanely expensive, but among watch people, it's, it's quite affordable. And so it's expensive enough to offer you that buzz, but not so expensive that it stresses you out like a lot of the Rolex watches that I have that have gone up in, in value. And so I never got it as an investment piece. And again, I wouldn't be 100% okay with it going up in value because it would change what I love about it, the wearability of it. And, you know, I wouldn't want to start looking at it as an investment piece, as a collector's piece, as something that's going up in value that I better keep nice. So will it hold its value, value retention? I think so. Will it go up in value? You know, I don't know. But, you know, if I had to choose sleepers, I might say the Hydronaut 1 is a sleeper, but hey, you know, maybe the hideous Hydronaut 2. But the Hydronaut 1, again, is beautiful and functional and wearable and very quality. This perhaps could be a sleeper. Maybe the fact that so many people think it's hideous could work for it. You know, I don't know, I'm not sure. But I think at best we can say it's gonna hold its value. And that's good enough for me, all right? So I think there's a measure of value retention. But jumping back to value, $3,000 for a highly functional watch, impeccable quality with the backing of Rolex itself. So I think there's a lot of value in this watch. Let me know what you think. In the next videos, we'll talk about the other two factors, usability, the X factor. Let me know what you think about the value and potentially uh, increasing value of the Iconaut. Is there a lot of value retention? Is it gonna tank in the future? Is it gonna go up? Let me know what you think in the comments section. Thanks for watching, take care, and I'll see you next time.